two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the September 22nd meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County in accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19. The board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety with without the pre physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's budget committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Bean if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Um, Ms. Bean, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. All right, uh, Ms. Hen. Present. Ms. Pasture. Ms. Jose. Ms. Mack. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Ms. Bean, could you please also call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Yes, uh, Dr. Scriven. Present. Mr. Saris. Present. Mr. Tantleff. Present. All right, that's it. Um, if there are any additional staff, please state your name now. All right, we're good to go. Okay, so our first item is an update on Spotlight on Spend, and for that, I will turn it over to Mr. George Saris, who will provide a brief um, update on Spotlight on Spend. Thank you, Ms. Mack. The, uh, we transitioned uh, last year away from a third-party vendor, which was Spikes Cavell, who provided the Spotlight on Spend. That was their product name and uh, moved to uh, managing this internally. And so we have both the, the archive of Spotlight on Spend as well as the spend analysis for last fiscal year. And uh, having shortly, cl uh, having closed out fiscal year 21, we're working on compiling that data and we hope to have it posted uh, in December uh, using the, uh, the internal tool. So uh, we remain in compliance with the state law that requires uh, selected uh, jurisdictions to provide this type of vendor information. So it's updated annually and we have hoped, uh, apart from the interruption of the cyber attack, that we will be uh, in a place in the future where we can update this quarterly as opposed to annually. And it would be much more useful at that in that format. Okay, um, it looks like Ms. Hen has a question and um, and then I'll ask Mr. McMillian and I actually have a question also. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Good afternoon, Mr. Sarah. Um, You need to get a little closer to your phone. I, I can't hear you, maybe other people can. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Can you hear me now? Better. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saris, uh, Ms. Mack and Mr. Saris. Um, Mr. Saris, could you describe the functionality of the internal tool Will it have the same um, interactive type of functionality and dashboarding that the previous um, tool did? And will board members have the ability to 
run reports on that tool. My second question is, um, when you say that's good news that you'll be able to update it more frequently, will the data still be in arrears? And can you talk about that? Yeah, the data is currently in arrears um, because we have to combine uh, the uh, purchase order based data with the P card based data and uh, that is a is a manual process. I don't believe that's going to change. The data can if you go to the website, uh, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet and you can manipulate that data. Um, I'm I guess I will try running a report here and see what I get. I've never uh, tried doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, it looks like uh, I can, you know, it's a 10,000 page report, which I don't recommend, but uh, if you uh, ask for five years or six years of data. So yes, if you, you can sort on the data and then you can run a report based on the ranges that you've established. Did we consider any other off the shelf tools that offer um, similar functionality um, as the old tool rather than, or are we considering any other tools? I know I was a, a frequent user of the other tool and found it helpful for slicing and dicing expenditures. So that's my first question. Um, and it, it sounds like the old system was um, more user friendly for that type of analysis, that ad hoc querying um, to answer specific questions about the data rather than going through 10,000 pages of, of a report. Yeah. My first question. And then my second question is, is there a way to reconcile budgeted versus actual expenditures based on our budget categories? Because currently those two aren't in alignment. So in other words, the categories of expenditures, um, at least how they were reported to, how they are reported to the state, um, aren't categorized um, the same as our our budget categories. So I'm wondering if, if I were um, developing the requirements for such a system that I would wanna see as a board member, those would be my two requirements the interactivity or the, the user friendliness of the old system, which I really liked and was hoping we would retain, plus the ability to align um, with our budget and look at projected versus actual spending. Those would be my two requirements. Could you speak right. to those? So the reason uh, we went with an internal tool is because uh, we believe we could get um, we could update the data more frequently. That was the problem with Spikes Cavell is that the data had to be transmitted and then we had to wait for them to compile it and load it into the dashboard. So this was intended to meet uh, one of the requests from the board, which was to make this data more current. Uh, you don't have to print all six years. You, it, it sorts just like an Excel spreadsheet, and I think it is just as user friendly. The uh, what you've uh, talked about budget data is separate from this. This is strictly a procurement tool. Uh, budget data never has been or was intended to be you know combined here so budget reports are something that we can provide uh currently and are happy to do that but uh crossing doing a crosswalk between these two 
reports is not something that was ever requested or nor is it built into this design. Do you have anything further, Ms. Hen? I don't, thank you, Ms. Mack. Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Saris, I have some questions. I am not a frequent user or was not a frequent user of Spotlight on Spend, but I'm very familiar with what it provided. You mentioned specifically purchase orders and P cards. Um, how, how do purchase orders and P cards match up with contracts, because it's my understanding Spotlight on Spend also shows spending at a contract level. Is that correct? So it shows spending at a vendor level. And so we have contracts with numerous vendors. Uh, and for items $2,000 or less, you, you access that contract with a P card and for larger expenditures you use a, a purchase order but the purchase order system and the p card system are two different entities so that data has to be commingled um, to create this uh, database so if if you were paying mac construction and on one purchase it was less than two thousand um, dollars and that would be put on the p card but the other contract was the bulk of the work that Mac Construction was doing for you. Right. That's on a purchase order number that is associated with a contract that you have with Mac Construction. Is, right. is that a true statement? There, the contract, there's one contract and there's two forms of payment. There's a P card payment or a check a voucher and a check disbursement. So the total, the combined spending for both of those methods is what we report here in this uh, spending analysis. Okay, and then just one more question now that I understand that part of it. So if, if the money, right now you're saying you have the ability or you plan to update it annually and you are looking at updating it quarterly, what when is a charge considered finalized that it would then be uploaded to the next quarter when when the check goes out when the p card is charged when the uh when the p card is charged um and when the check goes out right okay Those so right now if a check and a p card activity took place in january that would not be updated until next January. Yes, and that's why this is, uh, we, we want to uh, make this easier to update in-house without having to transmit data to a third party. And uh, we, we believe we can do that um, as our, reporting capabilities and our access to data following the cyber attack cyber attack are re are restored and my last question is this are there by design is there anything that will be excluded or what can we be assured that every expenditure via a check or a p card will be reflected in this database either annually or quarterly well I will, I'm going to do a sample here, but I don't know that we include mileage reimbursements. Uh, so let me test this out here and see if I can. Well, actually, even mileage uh, reimbursements are included. So I don't know that anything is excluded by design. Uh, the report, the, the state 
threshold is $25,000 a year or more. So, um, but I, I see uh, expenses uh, much less than that. So it looks like uh, we report everything. Okay, in, thank in you very much. System, Any, I'm right. sorry, go ahead, Mr. Saris. In the new system, everything is included from from my uh, review here while we're speaking. Okay, um, are there any follow-up questions before we remove, we move to the next item? Okay, hearing none. Um, our next item is a review of available information. Um, the Maryland State Department of Education selected financial data for Maryland public, public schools um, 2019 through 2020. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Witt Tantliff, who will provide the review. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, so for the uh, for this agenda item, uh, Ms. Hen and Ms. Pasteur asked that I show um, the committee what information is available in a set of MSD reports that come out on each year and show different uh, measurements and comparisons between the different LEAs in Maryland. So there's four reports and the most recent one's FY20, but if you go on the MSD website, um, it, there's several years worth of uh, these reports packaged up that you can look at. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go through the report and just explain what's there, um, just so you can get familiar with them, which is uh, what the goal was, I believe, today. But before I begin, I just want to note that it's difficult to use these reports to make any conclusions about comparisons between LEAs comparing any two numbers, and you'll see there's many, many numbers on these reports, and many of them at first glance uh, will seem very interesting to look into, but comparing any two numbers takes research to explain what's going on beneath the surface. So for instance, BCPS may, may look like we're spending more or less than average in any one category, but without extensive research, it's impossible to say um, whether we're doing better or worse than average and better or worse is a relative term. Um, one thing to also note is MSDE doesn't uh, in this report. Well, let me just, let me go into the report. So part one's focused on revenue and some other metrics. So you can see right here is table of contents. There's some definitions and these are definitions that will be used in the report. And then uh, you can see, and, I, and I'll come back to table one, but you can see here there's a number of tables in each report, and each table shows either a completely different or just a slightly different metric than the prior table. So, um, one, and one small thing to note on revenue here, it, it doesn't really affect the flavor of the report, but MSD doesn't roll up the revenue on these reports exactly how we're used to seeing it, which is either county revenue, state revenue, um, in the general fund, capital, um, et cetera. They do that to some extent, but, um, you'll see in some of the reports they mix and match some of the categories. So table one is revenue from all sources. So this is everything and it should tie it. And sometimes they don't include everything, but it should tie pretty much to our final uh, revenue and expenditure reports when we get to the expenditure uh, reports later on. Mr. Tantliff, excuse me, can you make yeah. that a little bit bigger, please? Is that better, Ms. Mack? I'm not too proud to ask you to go to 100. Thank you. Is that good? Yes, that's much better. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, okay, and if anyone wants to, these uh, were all in board docs. If anyone wants to open them on their local computer, local device. Uh, but one, one thing to note here, and again, this is FY20, so this is the existing 
uh, pre-Blueprint Bridge to Excellence formula. Um, but I think everyone here is at least a little familiar that that formula um, delivers different amounts of state revenue depending on a lot of different metrics in the formula. So over here, you can see the revenue from each source. Um, now, this includes capital and all the grants on this. So uh, we normally talk about the general revenue mix. But uh, just for instance, Baltimore County, you can see, uh, again, for everything is 50% local, whereas Baltimore City is only 31% local and Allegheny is only 23% local, um, whereas state is uh, by far in Allegheny and Baltimore City, the preponderance of their revenue. And that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's because those are poorer jurisdictions and the state funding formula um, generates more revenue depending on a lot of different metrics, but wealth is a big part of it. And as you expect, if you look down here at Montgomery County, only 28% of their overall revenue is delivered from the state. Um, we go to table two. This is current expenses and current expenses is basically general fund plus most of the grant revenue. So it's kind of uh, a mix that we wouldn't normally look at, um, but it's pretty reflective of uh, the general fund. Now this chart also includes the state paid teachers retirement. Um, several years ago, the state used to pay all of the state um, retirement for teachers, but as that became more and more expensive, they pushed some of the costs onto the local jurisdictions. And that's basically what we call the normal cost. So the ongoing cost of the pension is picked up by all the local counties now, where, but the historical kind of underfunded liability is paid by the state because they generated that underfunded liability. So in other words, they just pushed out to the counties a number of years ago and it's in our budget, the ongoing costs. So in this chart, they include in the state revenue, the state paid teachers retirement. So this would not tie to any um, report that we would ever generate internally because this is revenue they're contributing. So we don't ever see it because they're they're putting into the pension system on our behalf, but they're trying to reflect that in this report. So in any case, the numbers are a little different than the first table. The flavor is similar. Um, there's not capital in this report. There's not um, some of the other uh, buckets. You can see non-revenue here. This is for us fund balance, which also always gets a lot of conversation around budget time. And you can see the percent from each source, which is the flavor, like I said, is the same, but you can see in this one, Baltimore City gets even more of the revenue from the state. And that's mainly because the first chart had all of their um, federal grant revenue and their heavy in grant revenue. But uh, for this is more tilted towards general fund and you can see the state gives even a higher percentage to Baltimore City. Um, Mr. Tantliff, before you move off of this slide, why is Baltimore City the only LEA in the non-revenue column in a negative? I don't uh, know what that represents. Okay, I I'd just... Have to, I'd have to look into it. So yeah, that's an odd number. It's probably... I'm, I'm guessing without looking, there might have been some anomaly. Um, I, I don't really know what that, that would represent. It might be something unique to them, um, but they were losing, their, in other words, they're generating negative revenue there. Instead of revenue being added to the budget, it is being taken away. So um, I don't know what that would be. And you may have answered this, but why do school systems like Cecil, Charles, Dorchester, Frederick, Montgomery have no non-revenue in that column? Well, um, in the example I just gave, for instance, for Baltimore, we use fund, fund balance as a source and they um, it look, probably did not. But non-revenue means 
you're not actually generating new revenue. You know, we're we're using the fund balance, which is generated from our underspending in the prior year. The county takes that and then essentially reissues it to us the next year to complete the budget. So those counties either don't have a, a material amount of fund balance or they did, just didn't need to use it. The, the challenge is once you start using it one year, you, you really have to use it the next year because you're overlapping those dollars in your budget. So if if we ran, you know, if we start chipping away at it year after year and there's less fund balance, that would be dollars that we would need to make up either on the state and county side to keep our budget just at the same starting point as we had the prior year. Thank you. Sure. Then these tables are all just subtle differences on each other. So this is the same as a prior chart, but it excludes the state paid teachers retirement. So the pension costs they're paying on our behalf are excluded from this chart. So if that was interesting to you, um, that's here. This chart is just school construction. So this shows different sources of school construction. Um, and for us, you know, it's normally roughly a 50-50 uh, split. Now, um, this is what books in a given year, which might be different than how it's actually budgeted, but uh, this reflects in that year all the revenue that was provided for construction. And here's the source. You can see, you know, there's essentially no federal revenue. It's all local and state. And you can see the mix of the different counties uh, over to the side. Um, this is debt service on this chart. And <clears throat> you may recall debt service is, is something we report in the school system, but we don't um, actually hold any debt. We don't influence any debt. This is bonds that the county has issued on our behalf and we're required to report it in uh, the budget and in the CAFR. But it's uh, simply for us, just as I stated, we just report it. We don't actually handle that debt. Um, this is food service. Mr. Tantliff, um, sure. normally if we wait till the end of presentation because there's so much data. If you don't mind, if board members could ask questions like on specific slides, I think Ms. Hen has a question and then uh, I'll see yes. if Mr. McMillian has one. Yeah, that'd be fine if you just let me know when someone has uh, yeah, a question because you know. I can't see the little that, that's fine I'll I can't you know. see the main screen right now sure go ahead thank you Miss Mack um hi Mr. Tantliff hi, I hi. I heard today that there may be federal legislation um coming that provides 82 billion in grants nationwide for school construction um which would be amazing and I'm wondering since you you brought up um federal revenue for for construction um, would you anticipate or, or thinking about that any impact on our state or local revenue for construction or would that be bonus funds for us? Um, I, so I can't actually speak intelligently to that at all. I'm not familiar with the legislation and, and from what you just described, I don't know if it passed or it's something that could happen. Sure. But from, from what you said, I would assume that would all be incremental to what we have because all of our funding right now, um, including the Build to Learn Act, is all either funded by the state or the county. So that money is all identified and committed to. So the federal revenue to me would all be incremental. Uh, you know, I guess if the legislature wanted, they could say, well, hey, that lets us off the hook for some of the bill to learn money. Let's use the federal money to replace some of that. I don't I wouldn't imagine they would do that. It wouldn't have a great look, but uh, what the rules are and how it's treated uh, would remain to be seen based on how the feds put out the different rules, um, how many years it's over. Um, but I would think the intent would be for it to be incremental to the commitments that are out there already. Sure, and I don't expect you to have those details. Just asking in general if there's anything you were familiar with that um, might affect our, our local or state funding for construction if that 
were to come to fruition and we we all hope it does so sure thank you sure mr mcmillian do you have any questions at th thus far no thank you okay thank you mr tantliff go ahead sure and and this will get repetitive to some extent, so I'll go through them quickly and then we'll go to the next report. Uh, it's just whatever the committee would like to see or talk about, you know, that was kind of the goal today. Um, here is the <clears throat> current expense um, fund for state revenue. So this reflects how the these groupings up here are basically bridge to excellence or our state aid, how it's broken down and how those different components compare within um, each of the jurisdictions. Uh, it's, it's really not that important to tell you the truth because in the end, it all becomes part of our general fund and it's unrestricted and we don't keep track of them based on uh, these different buckets. Uh, this is only part of the the bridge to excellence formula. You can see over to the right is again that state state share of the teacher's pension, which they just want to show us. And you can see though it's pretty significant, $92 million. Um, and for perspective, that's almost triple our local contribution, which is again just for the ongoing expenses. This is to this is all playing catch up on the underfunded part or the unfunded historical part of the pension. Mr. Tantliff, can I ask a question specific to teacher pensions? Uh, sure. So I, it was my understanding based on a conversation I had with a MABE person at the last MABE conference that a person, when a person retires, he or she gets a, a pension from the state. But, and I thought it was 100% from the state, but it sounds like what you're saying is a number of years ago, local LEAs were required to fund parts of teachers' pensions. Is is that, uh, am I um, conflating sure. the two issues? Uh, no, but but I'll, I'll clarify your exact question. We are sending that money to the state retirement system. Oh, so okay. So it's going into, we're just now, all the money that needs to go into the state retirement bucket, we're putting in part of it but it's totally for the state pension plan. So if you're a teacher, you don't get anything from Baltimore County. Um, uh, so it, for instance, in, most of our employees are in the state retirement system because it's not only teachers, but generally if you become an administrator, but you started as a teacher, you'll s normally stay in the state pension system. Whereas, um, uh, here's a good example. Here's here's really a good example. Um, Brian Scriven, who's on the call, started as an educator, then a principal, and now an administrator. He would stay in the state pension. They wouldn't say, okay, you now need to move over to the county system. But if someone came in brand new and they didn't have a background in education, Kevin Smith, our prior um, CAOO, he would have gone into the county system because that position is not one that would normally be in the state system, but they normally allow you to remain in the state system once you start in the state system. That so conceivably, sense? could a teacher leave the state and go work as a child life person at the state of Maryland hospital and have their pension bridge, have their pension combined because they're going from quote one state job to another. Do you know? Um, uh, normally, the the rules in Maryland are uh, are such that you can switch from one pension system to another pension system as long as you don't have an excessive break in service. Now, uh, I don't know anything about the, the system. If it's just the regular state system. Or to do so, it might not be the state has several different pension plans. Oh no, I'm I'm aware yeah. of that. So and I don't want to take up too much time. It was yeah. It's so just a curiosity. The, yeah. So normally, though, in Maryland, if you don't, it it's it the rules are determined by where you're going to. 
So normally in the state system, you have 30 days where you can be not employed at all. So you have to start your new job within 30 days. So if you were a teacher with 10 years and you took a county job that had nothing to do with education, so you th the state the state wouldn't allow you to like they would if you're staying within the school system. You're doing an administration job in the county. If you took that job within 30 days, you could take your 10 state years and convert them to Baltimore County pension years. And now you'd have 10 years in the Baltimore County pension. Oh. If you went from one state, uh, if you stayed within this, you know, if you, that's why teachers can go between jurisdictions. They'll keep their time in the pension system in Maryland. And I think okay. a lot that of states don't have That was actually where I was going. OK, thank you. A lot so of states don't could have I that. just I just wanted sure. to briefly interject. Uh, a, a, te a retired teacher would get their health care benefits through Baltimore County right. government, not the state of Maryland. Right. I, I think that was also, I, I learned that at MAVE also, but the by and large, the pension is a state pension. For teachers, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. Sure. <clears throat> um, so, in any case, table seven was uh the state components of state aid and here's more components of it um here's the formula which means the bridge to excellence formula state aid non-public placements that represents the state's contribution to non-pub and there's a kind of a complicated formula where um, we share in the expense of children that are non-pub um, and you know those, those expenses can typically be 75 or eighty thousand dollars if a child's in a non-pub environment for a whole year and it could be even more uh, depending on the disability um, here's transportation but again these uh, funds all get commingled into the general fund and this is just uh, adult education, which you can see we don't have anything bucketed for that. And that's uh, pretty much. Oh, hold on, let me see here. Um, OK, now this. Uh, these are different buckets that are provided. Uh, same thing. These are uh, state grants and the, the these are also limited English proficiencies, part of the bridge to excellence formula. Um, this is the state contribution to food service, which you can see is very low. It's mostly federal and local for food service, not local from the county, but but locally generated from sales and from federal here, school construction. Um, here's federal revenue and the different grant buckets. You can see it goes on like this. These are just different ways to slice and dice revenue. I mean, that's when you get down to it. It's all the different buckets of revenue we get sliced and diced in a lot of different ways. So you can see all of the counties in Maryland in one place. Uh, this chart right here, nine, compares local wealth. Local wealth is a is a large generator in the bridge to excellence formula. So the lower your relative wealth, the more funding it generates from the state formula. For most people, this is not going to really mean much to see this uh, metric. But these are these are kind of the nuts and bolts of the bridge to excellence formula and the components that uh, drive the formula. Compensatory education. Again, this is the this is the nuts and bolts between one component of the Bridge to Excellence formula, or Thornton, as it used to be called. And I, and I know it's um, it's a heavy topic uh, to really go into depth, but most people are not going to do much with this data here. Um, for the committee members, th these would probably be things that are less um, interesting. So that's pretty much it for the first report. Then the second reports on expenditures. Now tell me uh, right now, can you see part two? Yes. OK, great. So part two deals with expenditures. Whereas part one again was just different slicing and dicing of revenue. 
So here's to give you some highlights, talk a little bit about it. Uh, here's definitions. And a lot of these, de these are definitions used in the report, but it also ties to definitions you're familiar with for uh, activities, um, things we use in the budget appropriation transfer, uh, the different activities in uh, the budget administration, which I know is always a fan favorite but uh, all the rest of them are in here too. And it just gives you a little definition. It's a nice little um, handy dandy tool there to show you that. <clears throat> so here's the total current expense fund. And again, current expense is for the most part the general fund, but it also includes most of our grant dollars because they consider those as um, helping to drive day-to-day -day activity. That's basically how they define current expense. But for the most part, this is um, the general fund, which you know during the budget process, that is obviously what we talk about the most. So you can see this is just the different components of the current expense fund, how we spent in those categories. So for instance, um, and again, this is just, it's an absolute number, uh, which wouldn't tell you anything because you don't have any relative comparison. And then even when you have a relative comparison, which you'll see later, it still doesn't necessarily tell you something until you really go down deep and peel back the onion. But this tells you how much uh, in each of these buckets, so here's administration, how much each LEA spent for administration. So Baltimore spent 60 million, as did Montgomery and PG. Um, Baltimore City spent a little less um, and then you can see uh, obviously as the counties get smaller they spend less and here's the all the other uh, activities across the top. Now uh, one thing of note here they bucket the three instructional activities um, other expenses textbooks and salaries into one bucket here. So that's something that's a little different. We don't ever show it like that. It's um, that's just what they've cho how they've chosen to show it. But I think later on they do break down the components of it. And here's just continuing the rest of the budget that they couldn't show on the first page, just the different buckets and how the expenditures hit. Sorry, I dribbled a little. Um, here's administration. So now what they're doing is they're going to go into each activity and they're going to break it down by object. So within administration, so this is pages just administration, they're going to break down salaries, contracted services, supplies, other charges, equipment, etc. and showing that uh, between all the different counties. Mr. Tantliff, can I just yes. stop you for a minute and um, ask Ms. Ken for some guidance? Um, looks like there's two more reports. I find this very interesting and I'd like to delve into it a little further. Um, and Ms. Ken has a question, I think, about some something that you've just covered. Um, is it possible that we, and I'm very conscious of people's time, is it possible that we finish up with this report and perhaps carry over the next two reports to until the October 20th meeting? If you're asking me or Ms. Hen, for me, I'm, I, I'm happy I mean, to do whatever the committee would like to do. Ms. Hen? So we are scheduled to go until seven, is that correct? Ms. Oh, I thought, oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was just. We, I have until seven, so I think Let's oh, see. I thought it was 6.30, sorry. Let's see how far we get. Um, I agree, this is a, a great discussion. Um, my question that I put I, in- I apologize, I, I didn't know about, I saw, thought it was 6.30. Go ahead, Ms. Ham, with your question. No, I think no they problem. were an hour last year, so if it, you know, maybe it got changed to an hour and a half. Yes, I, I was wondering this the same when I saw that on the, the calendar. Um, my question was, and this is in line with Ms. Mack's question, um, do you know if MSDE produces an analysis of these data? And if so, 
is it available either publicly or to local boards? Do they have staff that produce analyses? By analyses, can you what 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 are you thinking? Along the lines of um, benchmarking, but maybe not something that formal in terms of discussing um, trends across the LEAs. Uh, I think other than these reports, uh, George can chime in. I doubt there's anything more than these reports. They are just wouldn't have the resources to do it. And honestly, I don't know if they'd have the interest to do it. So they pull this data together, which takes them quite a while um, and sometimes is not very timely. Um, so I've never seen anything else, so I can't say that definitively. But I would be surprised this type of analysis if there was anything more out there than this. This is uh, George Saris. I'm not aware of anything either. And um, unfortunately, MSDE is is a uh, operating it with very minimal staff and resources and. Uh, I'm quite sure that if there were other data, we would uh, be using it and be aware of it. But I'm not, as much as I've looked through their site I, and compared notes with other finance officers, I have not seen it. And they really rely on the locals for, uh, yeah, obviously this data comes from each of us. They, they're just compiling it around their own uh structures okay do you know if um ggs looks at it specifically ola since they look at every lea what is it every three years seven years uh seven Five, seven and and i am not aware now okay they've never mentioned it in our legislative audits of which there have been three, so I'm assuming we'd know about that. Okay, I would think it'd be a, an interesting, if nothing else, point of um, data for them to to spot. Um, I don't know, or to look at outlying data points. Um, perhaps not if if they're not looking at it. But again, I, I think staff, um, everyone's lean in the in the staffing, so. OK, that's all I had, Ms. Mack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Mr. Tantliff. Sure. Um, so table two is administration. It's absolute dollars. Um, administration into the big object activity or categories, if you want to call it that, compares it across the LEAs. Here's the same thing for mid-level uh, administration, which again is mostly the office of the principal. Um, it's principals, APs, but there's also for us some people and expenditures at Jefferson that fall into mid-level. <clears throat> here's instructional, and so this is the three activities, but they can, they sort of break it apart here. They break apart instructional salaries and they uh, break that apart. And then you can see over here is textbooks and other supplies and materials. So. This is all of what they're calling instruction, uh, the three activities and breaking that into um, an object level look. Um, let's see, this is other instructional costs. So this is the rest of it on this page, instruction. Um, let's see, this is adult education, which we saw there's very little in Baltimore County. Here's special ed, the breakdown um, for salaries, contracted services, and then here's the rest, um, the rest of special education. So again, a lot of these take two pages to go through it all. Student personnel, so et cetera, et cetera. It goes through each activity, student health, student transportation, Um, operation of plant, maintenance of plant, 
other charges, which you can see it's giant. And just as a reminder, this is almost all uh, benefit costs. Um, and this is the just the breakdown within the uh, fixed charges, how they hit each activity. So basically the fringe benefits by activity. Um, community services. See, it's very small. A uh, capital outlay, and this is this is um, items categorized in the capital bucket, not capital expenditures, not our capital budget that we just passed. This is just uh, smaller items that get categorized as capital within the operating budget. Here's food service. Um, here's other charges. Here's total school construction for the year. So you can see that's a big dollar amount and it varies by year. Debt service, we talked about, we just report it. And um, here's total current expenditure. So this is basically our general fund with some grant money by object instead of activity. So salaries, contracted services, supplies and materials, et cetera. And that's it for this report. Um, here, let me see my notes here. Mr. Okay, Pavilion, this... Ms. Hen, any questions? No, I don't have any questions. But I did notice that the agenda on board docs was this projected to be over at 6.30? I heard the seven o'clock thrown out there. Uh, my calendar invite says seven o'clock, Mr. McMillian, so that's what I was going off of. The Janus show shows 6.30. I was just curious which time frame it was. Thank we, you. We, well, I guess the, the board, the committee could decide going forward whether they'd like it to be an hour, an hour and a half. So we made the agenda an hour based on the meetings from last year. Uh, the invites an hour and a half. I don't know if that's a change the committee wants, but I would think you you all could decide which you'd prefer going forward. Mr. McMillian, do you have a conflict? Kind of, sort of, but I'll tough it out. OK, yeah, I, I mean, I have to be honest, I thought it was over at 630 also. Uh, why don't I go through these reports real quick? OK, just, thank you. I'll just give you a glance and then you can look at them at your leisure. And then what we'll do is hold you... questions and email you if and yeah. just in the interest of time. OK, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, I think it's, honestly, it's, it's it's probably not. We don't probably need to make this a full agenda item next time. You can just look through it and see if there's anything. Now that so part three is analysis of costs. So this Miss Hen, this is probably the closest it'll get to what you were asking about. It's giving some relative metrics and it's slicing and dicing the expenses in different ways that you can compare. It's not apples to apples. I want to emphasize that. And when we were talking about the agenda, I, I really made that point. Just because something looks higher or lower, you really need to do a tremendous analysis to compare two numbers, but it might tell you two numbers you'd like to compare. So this is taking the cost per pupil belonging, and you'll see some of these reports will switch between belonging and I'm going to go back. Um, let's see, it goes from belonging. Oh, these are all be belonging and attending. Attending means your average attendance. Belonging means your official enrollment on September 30th. So the numbers between the two charts you can see are very, very close. You know, because on average, you have several percentage of students that are absent every day. So the relative uh, number should be very, very close. The absolute number should be very, very close between the two sets of reports. Um, so what this is doing is, again, it's taking our current expense, which is mostly the general fund, and it's dividing it by the number of students, and you can compare the LEAs per pupil. Um, this and, and you can see they include, they exclude. So this includes transportation per pupil. This excludes transportation per pupil. So obviously, if you were spending a lot of money per student for transportation, you would, uh, and these rank, you can see the rank, relative rank 
also. Um, and the rank here being highest is the lowest number. Um, so including state retirement, not including it, including transportation, not including it. So same thing here, cost per pupil for administration, mid-level, the different activities, um, cost per pupil belonging for the rest of the activities. Uh, I think you get the, the gist of it. It's ranking and you can't take the ranking as gospel. It takes a lot more analysis, but uh, they do the um, attending and belonging. They do the exact same report. So here's cost per student belonging just from federal funds. So it's taking federal funds and putting it into the different activities. This, this would be a chart that really doesn't have any meaning. Some of the charts have meaning. Some, maybe it's interesting to someone, but not to most people. This excludes federal funds and does the per pupil breakdowns. Um, here's the percent that you've spent in each category. So what percent of your spending uh, for Baltimore? 3.6% was administration, 6.23 was mid-level, et cetera. So it's comparing percentages. So you can see it's, if the data was perfect, this would give you uh, a good jump off point for comparisons. And that's really what the rest of this does. Um, here we get back to the total expenses by category. You've actually seen this chart already in um, the second set of tables. And this is giving you enrollment numbers. So this is what they're using to get the per pupil expenditures. Now we're taking instructional. You've seen this actually split up by county too. Um, let me see if they do they so that's the end actually of this one and then on the fourth report this is giving trends um so this really uh this could be interesting this just tells you um from left to right uh revenue for current expenses uh, it's school construction food service and debt service so this is almost uh, everything. You can see how our dollars, as you expect, they went from 1.5 million to a little over 2 million over the 10 year period. And it also shows the percent change over one and uh, 10 year. And it's showing that for each county, you know, maybe that's interesting, maybe it's not. Um, revenue from all sources, let's see. Current expenses, yeah, so same chart, just slightly different than the last chart. It's excluding a few things, and the header tells you what's in and what's out. So that's kind of how this goes. This this guy, this chart is all 10-year trends, gives you percent changes. So, you know, that might be interesting. How much did the budget change over 10 years? How much did Howard County change over 10 years? Here's the federal government. Um, and you can see a lot of negatives here on the federal side. Um, actually, and this this isn't that, uh, let's see, how much do they have here? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm just thinking what this is telling me. I think there's just a lot more volatility, but you can see, I think in 10 and 11, the number's really big because that was when we had what was called ARA funds. So that was kind of the tail end of the stimulus from the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So we got a bunch of money from the feds, just like we're getting a bunch of grant money now um, on the ESSER funds. We got a bunch of money in 10 and 11. And that's why, and you can see we still, FY11, FY12, we still had a little, and then it dropped off back to our normal run rate. So that is sort of an anomaly. You can see here we're including different things and here's the trend. And bringing this home, all kind of the same thing, just slightly different things are included. Um, this is just state revenue here. So there's no county, same comparisons though. Um, this is just library books. So they're just slicing and dicing things, showing trends, 
and showing um, how much it's grown by. And here is cost per pupil. So this is something that come, you know, it's a number we banter about a lot. So this is total state cost per pupil. Um, this is assessed valuation. Again, this is this chart would not be meaningful. It's just valuation changes. Um, Full-time equivalent. So this is uh, the FTEs that were counted. Uh, you can see here's the famous Baltimore City drop-off. And here you can see we had strong growth. Of course, uh, once this table gets extended, we'll unfortunately, uh, along with that, almost everyone else, see a drop-off due to COVID. So that's it in a nutshell. That's what this uh, fourth set of tables shows. It's 10-year trends. Mr. Tantliff, I don't think you can see the question, but Ms. Hen asked, is this information provided to school systems in an Excel format and would it be available to board members in an Excel format? Yes, if you, uh, I'll send Tracy the link. So if you go onto that landing page, you can see the report in PDF or Excel. It's right there and you can pick whichever one you want. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I, I think there um, people have other commitments. I, w I personally would like to thank you very much for this. Uh, it's the type of stuff I like to look at, and I appreciate you taking the time to pull it together and present it to us. I would encourage board members to spend as much or as little time as they want looking at this data, submitting questions to Ms. Hen, um, and uh, directly to you, Mr. Tantliff, and uh, we can pick up maybe the questions at the next meeting, depending on what the agenda is. Are there any comments or questions before we adjourn? Oh, Mr. McMillian, go right ahead. Yeah, at some point in the future, can we look at the our budgetary process and a timeline for how our budget is built? Uh, like, for example, you know, there's got to be a time frame when when the different departments are working on making their submissions for the next budget and there's got to be a deadline for it and then that deadline and we compare what they you know possibly received last year as compared to this year how they're building that I want to see how the our budget's built and then I, I want to throw this out too I'm how do you alleviate if you give you know a particular department x number of dollars and they're frugal with their money and they watch their money throughout the the year and and they're they're they've done an outstanding job with it. what happens toward the end of the fiscal year then people like are in this panic to spend what they've been frugal with all along because they're afraid that they're not gonna you know the, the old mentality is it well if you don't spend it you won't get it back next year uh how do how do we alleviate that circumvent that work with that you know that mentality that you have to spend it or you're not going to get what you received last year mr tantler can you just address that real quickly yes, sure uh well the first part of your question um uh, we put the agenda together uh um miss han and miss pasture can you know propose that as a budget item and it'd be very timely to do that uh next month if that's what uh the committee wishes um, I don't think we have as much of a problem in in the regard to trying to spend as you think, because this is why. Uh, the offices right now are putting their budgets together. So we had all the kickoff meetings and trainings over the last two weeks and their initial cuts at each office submitting the budget is due September 30th. And then we meet with the chiefs throughout October to refine the budget. The budgets are final. If you think about it, the superintendent proposes and the uh, or the board adopts in February, then the budget's finalized. So as they get to the end of the year, the budget's already set for the following year. You know what I mean? So even if they don't spend, it's gonna at that point it'll have no impact on how how their budget was built for the for the future year. Now they may feel like they want to get the spending in because they had intended to 
and they just didn't get around to it. I think that's what you see more of, just they had something that was important but not urgent. They meant to go get their act together, get a PO together, if they needed an RFP, if it was something larger, and then they find that they're running out of time to get everything done. Because, you know, PO deadlines come in April because we don't want people cutting POs in June because we need to book everything by year end. So there really shouldn't, wouldn't be, I can't speak obviously for anyone in particular, but they should know their budgets already set and it's not going to be impacted if they don't spend it year end. Like I said, I think the panic is more, they just realize that they waited till the last minute and they're maybe thinking they have till June, even though we're repeating, repeating, repeating and telling them that the deadline um, is coming up in April. And then they find out it's like two days before the deadline and they, you know, try to get everything in and they can't. Yeah. M Mr. Taylor, I think that it, it's interesting how what you just described. And, and I, I bet you that some people are not connecting the dots that 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 money's already allocated for the following year so they don't have to spend it because it's already built in and and yeah. i but i in april i've seen it i've seen people randomly spend you know they go around the building and ask you know what do you what do you need what do you need and you know got to get in a certain day and it's because they've saved that money or they've been frugal with it over the course of the year now they've got this lump sum of money and the, and the thing is we've got to spend this even, and they're not connecting the dots that that money's already built in for the following year. See, Mr. Uh, McNeil, you're, you're actually talking about schools and schools are even less impacted by that because the school budgets are allocated by formula based on their number of students. So there, so whereas an office, there might like the superintendent cut four and a half million dollars last year to fund the COLA. But the schools are getting a per pupil allocation strictly based on their enrollment. So they're even more arm's length from not spending it. They, you know, that wouldn't in any way, the way we run the budget, that would not ever impact their budget the following year. Okay. Thank you very much for answering, taking time to answer my questions. Thank you. But can I just ask that we flush that out a little bit at the next meeting? Because the I have had principals tell me the same thing. So I, I do want to understand the connection between how schools spend money and how the system spend money and how the timelines are different or if they are different. So I'll, I'll throw that out to Ms. Hennett for consideration. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I will, I've taken a note and we'll add that as well as Mr. McMillian's first agenda item um, for consideration for the next meeting, the budget process and timeline. I think that's very timely. I um, do too. Um, are there any other questions? If not, um, the next meeting of the budget committee will be on October the 20th, 2021. And because there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Tantliff, Mr. Saris. Sure. Um, Mr. Corns, Ms. Gover, everybody on here, Ms. Bean, thank you all very much for your time and for the information. Have a great evening. Sure, take Thank care. Thank you. Enjoy Bye. your evening. You too. Thank you.